Hi everyone, welcome to the IMS Business Report 2021. We're going to look back at 2020, see what happened, and learn lessons that we can all use to make our sector stronger. And we're going to end with the IMS valuation of the size of the electronic music industry. Let's get started. The overall conclusion, looking back at all this time, has got to be one about devastation. So much of our sector was, and there's no better word, devastated by what happened in the pandemic. But there are inspiring lessons dotted throughout this report of brilliant innovation. People struggled and found ways to do new, exciting things that should sustain in the future. And hence, the big challenge that we're labeling this report with, that was the easy part. In many ways, that innovation was the easy part. How are we going to sustain it when we're back in a world of parties and clubs? We're going to go through the conclusions now in the next 30 minutes, but also let me advise you, please go download the full version of the report. It contains 97 pages of awesome insight, stories and lessons from more than 22 interviews with industry leaders across our sector and more than 35 data sets many of which are exclusive to IMS, or the analysis is exclusive to IMS. Go, it's gold, get the report. In the meantime, let's walk through the main conclusions right now. We'll start with recorded music. Our conclusion is about hip hop, what? Let me explain. Hip hop we think is plateauing. I'll explain why that's so important. The main reason being, because it's time to build, it's time for dance music to take centre stage once again. And now, we've got to get our ducks in a row to be ready for that moment. Let me show you why I think that's the big conclusion and why that's what we need to act on. This quote from Anton of Warner's sums up the whole section for me brilliantly. Hip hop is coming out four or five years where it is far more exciting and relevant. Every three or four years, though, a generation finds something that's fresh and exciting to them. That's electronic music right now. Right, let's walk through the data and see if we agree. First, we're going to look at market share, and we'll start with Germany. German market share for dance music has been stable but growing for a long time now. Rapid growth 2014-15, and then steady and consistent growth year on year since then. Wolfgang at Sony says that's a lot to do with commercial radio recognizing dance music as one of the primary drivers. Good work, Germany. But let's look at hip hop in Germany. It started off at lower levels, but similar levels. Also experienced that rapid growth 2014, 2015, but has continued that growth and accelerated that growth in recent years. Crazy growth. Awesome and inspiring. Lots we can learn. We'll come on to that soon. Let's take a look at the US though. Biggest market there is. Stable, significant, stable market share over time. Slight decline year on year, 2019s, 2020. That will become important when we get to the valuation shortly. But overall, a story of stability. Let's look at hip hop. Of course, it was always more culturally relevant in the US than in other countries. It started from a higher base, but it also has this rapid growth in recent years. Looks like it's flattening off. And let's look at the UK, a huge lead relative to the US and Germany in dance market share up at 15.4% at the start of this period, but a decline year on year around 16, 17, 18, still declining, but slowing down. Let's look at hip hop, starting from a lower base in the UK, but in almost a mirror image of what happened in dance music, it's accelerated as we've declined, and it's also plateauing. So hip hop slight decline in Germany, flattening in the US, flattening in the UK, dance music, lots of decline except for Germany, good word Germany, and starting to flatten off. Those curves are going to cross again. It's our time in the spotlight, get ready. To better understand the time periods of change and the countries of change, we've done some exclusive analysis, looking at Spotify's top 200 uh, songs and dance music's share of those top 200 has been declining over the last couple of years in 17 out of the 18 countries we've looked at. 
I'm not going to tell you what the 18th country is. Open the report, find it yourself. It's a good story. 17 out of 18, though, decline in dance market share. Well worth a look through this data to see which countries are up and down, the relative performance of dance versus hip hop. It's awesome data, but it exaggerates the trend that we've seen in the market share data. So something's going on, dance is declining, but flattening time for our moment in the sun. Let's look at share, not just of Spotify, not just of market share, but let's look at share of social. Why? Because Goldman Sachs says we expect an increase in the importance of social media for music discovery and promotion. If we're going to shift market share, we've got to shift share of social. Let's take a look. Dance music, market share, share of social across lots of different platforms. Really high for SoundCloud. No surprise there. But across other social or, or music sites, much lower market share. Let's get some context. What does that look like for hip hop? Ah. We are not winning the market share battle in music. We're not winning it in social though. And this provides one of the clues as a driver of music that we're losing the market share in social. We've spoke to a bunch of experts to better understand that. Here's some quotes. In a world of abundance, we've gravi gravitated towards celebs who come with character, fashion, and culture. Hip hop, of course, is full of them. Electronic music, mm, not so much. Here's another quote. Electronic music has traditionally been very faceless. Artists and household names can be counted on a couple of hands. Finally, there are lots of young people who have sat in their bedroom trying to be Dead Mouse that are now sitting in their bedroom trying to be Lil Nas X or trying to be the guy that delivered the beats for Lil Nas X. Says Bart, who you're going to hear from in a minute on the panel. Ask him about that. But social matters. Artists who are rounded matter and it drives market share. Our time for growth is coming. One way we can capitalize on that opportunity is to support, find, engage more rounded artists. They might be artists that challenge us, that are different from us. They might not be the usual kind of artists we work with, but stretching ourselves outside of our comfort zone to find and support artists who are more rounded like this is one of the big opportunities we face. Now's our time. It's a huge opportunity. As I say, it's not just the numbers and the flattening of dance, the cresting of the wave of hip hop that makes me think that our time is coming. Talking to a bunch of people in the industry, you can feel the buzz of energy around growth that's starting. There are so many different signs. Let me show you some of the ones that I've picked up in preparing for this report. First, here's Anton again at Warner. We're seeing growth even without clubs and festivals to give tracks context, which is remarkable. Remember, in the past, often tracks had six or eight months of wind in their sales from clubs before they became hits. So finding hits without that, remarkable sign that culture is ready for us. What else are we seeing? Signs of growth from lots of places. And of course, you always see growth before it manifests itself in the numbers if you're at the cutting edge. That's why we've spoken to all these people. Beatport sales up 33%, despite download sales overall, all genres down 16%. Remarkable achievement and a sign that there's vibrancy and energy in our scene. Growth is starting. The majors staffing up for growth, recognizing that cultural nuances from our sector are important in staffing up. Look at content investment. Warner's $100 million acquisition of David Getter's catalog. There's something else to ask Bart about in a moment. And then you've got signs from fashion where runway shows are picking up dance music as their soundtrack really interesting innovations and in business models around curated travel, around education, and then wellness, acoustic, and ambient stuff. Check out Endel, the app. It's awesome. Innovative ways of getting electronic music to people and for people to engage in electronic music. So many signs that culture is picking up on this buzz and that our time is now. Let's dig into our scene now. Let's look at Beatport charts. Inside Beatport, we see what's going on in our scene and techno, 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 techno. Look, the fifth year in a row where techno is dominating the Beatport charts. What else do we see? House continues to expand its share, rising to the second most popular genre in 2020. Drum and bass continued to grow, now the fourth biggest genre that they're seeing. And then the newly created dance electropop genre, already in the top 10, coming in at eighth position.
growth? What does it look like? What genres, what artists are coming through? Let's take a look at festivals and clubs next. I really struggled with this section, I'm gonna be honest with you. I struggle because it's really just a story of sadness and devastation. I didn't wanna call it that, so I've called it something slightly more optimistic. Let's go with the fallow year, a chance to rest and a chance to come back stronger and more vibrant. Let's look for signs of that. But first let's celebrate or recognize the devastation that happened. Take a moment to think about the festivals that were canceled over the last year. This is a list we put together of everyone we could find. More than 200 electronic music festivals canceled or postponed. Hundreds of thousands of people out of work. Just think about the artists that didn't perform their craft. Think about the audiences that didn't engage in their culture. Billions of dollars, contributions to local economies, wiped out. Think about clubs. We took a look at Ibiza search demand in the UK. Well, it's interesting to note the year-on-year -year trend of this, by the way, but a very regular pattern. So we put together a forecast of what should have happened, the dotted line, over the last 18 months. The solid line, what did happen, tragedy. Enthusiasm, cut down. Enthusiasm, cut down. And this year, no searches. There is optimism though. Many clubs gave their space up for good causes during the pandemic. Here we've got blood donation, we've got food banks, and we've got vaccination centers in clubs. And there's some positive optimism around what's next and an important call to action to get our sector open as well. First, if you look at test events, transmission rates are pretty favorable compared to the base rates. These can be done safely if we're smart about it. That's good evidence to use. People want to open up. Data from Skiddle is incredibly encouraging. Festival tickets sold up 123% March to May versus the same period pre-pandemic. Some crazy stats here. Also, in terms of a call to action, our effectiveness at lobbying is going to improve if we're better able to articulate what it is about the cultural impact as well as the economic impact of our actions that makes them so important. The better we are able to tell a story about the role we play in people's lives, the scale of that role and its impact on communities and society, the better we'll be respected and supported in opening up. We've got a lot more work to do to create that bank of evidence. Let's look at one of the hottest topics of the year then, live streaming. Our conclusion, there's three ways that live streaming can really work. Enroll, engage, and excite. We're gonna show you some numbers and we're gonna show you examples of what those three things mean. First, on the numbers. This is total Twitch streams for all uh, music category uh, streams. And just look at what happened during the pandemic. Absolute explosion in engagement and usage of the platform. This shows that live streaming really took off in 2020. And finally, the electronic music industry embraced it. The question though, is live streaming about expanding your audience, reaching new fans, or is it about engaging your audience, exploiting existing fans? Well, that question got us thinking, and we came up with these three pillars I mentioned of live streaming enrolling your audience, getting them signed up, getting their uh, information for indirect monetization. Second, engaging your audience and monetizing them in the moment. And third, knock it out of the park at live streams that excite your audience and are monetized much more directly. Let's show you examples of these three pillars. First, enrolling your audience. YouTube subscribers for Defected and Beatport really accelerated showing that you can get new fans this way. Here's defected and the dotted line, our forecast, what would have happened if we carried on? The solid line, actual, what did happen? 140,000 more subscribers than expected. Thank you to the pandemic. Beatport, again, similar story, different graph. Dotted line is what we expected to see. Solid line, actual 106,000 more subscribers than expected. The key lesson, yes, you can drive subscribers if you're driving to enrollment. If you're doing live streams, drive to enrollment, get people to sign up. Let's look at pillar two, 
We use Twitch as an example of Pillar 2. Just look at the top dance music Twitch accounts and their growth pre-pandemic, almost nothing going on. A few uh, trailblazers. Pandemic, huge growth, but not big numbers compared to other live streams. Let's look at that first quote. I wouldn't have a job now if it wasn't for Twitch. Disclosure has 30,000 followers, our lowest number on any platform. But our engagement rate is the highest. Twitch people stay for eight hours. It's probably the most connected we've felt to our fans ever. Small, but perfectly formed audience. The other quote, Twitch is a cross between MTV and a Vegas slot machine. Addictive all day entertainment you can keep putting your money into with a community attached. Awesome quote, really brings to life what Twitch is. Very different from YouTube, like we say. Let's look at pillar three, exciting your audience. And there are so many knockout successes, great stories that were told. We've chosen three to really illustrate how you can do this exciting pillar. First, let's look at Dua Lipa Studio 2054, which was extravagant and captivating as the main hook. Success, more tickets than a world tour. Let's look at Pete Tong's Oh Come All Ye Ravers. Uplifting and joyful was the hook for this one and more tickets than the O2 capacity. Success there. And look at Biceps Live Global Stream 2, one of my favorites from this period. Pure and simple is the driver of that success. More tickets than if they played that night in a super club. There's lots of different ways of looking at success, but knock it out of the park examples of spectacles that couldn't or unlikely to be experienced in the real world. The lesson, have a strong reason or a strong theme and make it memorable, whichever your reason is. Doesn't have to be one of these. Make it memorable. And while we've focused on accessible platforms and exciting use cases in those case studies, a note about making sure artists get paid. There's more we can all do to push for this. It's about getting and it's about giving. In terms of getting rights, we all need to put pressure on platforms. Here's two people putting some pressure on platforms. Jules O'Riordan, aka Judge Jules. I find it almost repulsive that social media companies will leave up foul, racist, misogynist, and otherwise abusive content, but will tear down live streams at a moment's notice. Sort it out, get licenses, he says. Here's a quote I got from a head of marketing at a dance label. Did not want to be identified for the report, which tells you something. Twitch should pull their finger out. They've got enough money and enough data. They should be able to get the licenses. So guys, let's put pressure on the platforms to get licenses, but also let's put pressure on labels to give licenses. Here's a quote about how labels haven't been as flexible as they could have been, saying the mechanism often wasn't there for an artist to get paid. Why? Because the licenses are complex. Come on labels, do your best, be flexible, help the situation. So getting and giving rights, critical. And it's okay to use these platforms and engage audiences, but we've got to work towards rights. Next, let's look at engaging fans, new technologies, major breakthroughs. And back in 2008, Kevin Kelly, who is editor of Wired magazine said, hey, don't worry, if you have a thousand true fans, you can live a good career. You can monetize your career well as an artist. That always seemed very hard to do in practice. I think looking at 2020, 2021, this has finally come true. Here's what we found. First, gotta look at NFTs. Non-fungible tokens of data on a digital ledger that certifies a digital asset to be unique and therefore not interchangeable. Wonderful, thank you. What happened? Well, let's look at the numbers. First, you notice almost nothing happened in terms of NFTs in 2020. This is a 2021 story, very much so. And then in 2021, just look at the orange bar. That's us, it's electronic music, pioneering the use of NFTs. 76% of all music NFT issues were $50.2 million were issued by electronic artists. Really pioneering this use case, around, mostly around digital collectibles. The point being that digital collectibles allow exclusivity and price discrimination, which is what the video game industry has done so well in terms of their monetization for a long time. And it's starting to enable artists, electronic artists, to capitalize on those two things as well. 
But that's not the biggest story in NFTs. The biggest story is that the real use cases have not been found yet. And we've got to get stuck in, try, experiment and explore to try and find them. This didn't exist eight months ago. We need to push as many use cases as we can to learn. We don't even know what all the uses are yet. Get involved, get engaged, try it out. The blockchain offers the promise of a transparent way to get paid instantly and every time when your content is streamed. Just think about that as a promise. It would revolutionize our industry. It's one of many ways that the future of blockchain is much more exciting than even the $50.2 million that we've seen in the last 18 months. Another method of engaging fans, Patreon, which was around for a long time, but really saw during 2020. Look at Bill Brewster's numbers on Patreon and his huge rise during the pandemic. We talked to Bill to better understand what this is, how it works, and what lessons we can all learn from his experience. So here's four lessons. First, it's about community of like-minded people coming together around similar interests, not a broadcast medium, a community. Second, it's about focus. Know what you have that's special. Bill worked it out and built his Patreon around that. Yours will be different. What do you have that's special? Third, don't be shy. Bill says, I've always been slightly embarrassed about the self-promotion aspect, but you know what? No one batted an eyelid. The response was amazing. Don't be shy. I bet that's holding a lot of you back. Open up, engage. People won't bat an eyelid. They'll, be lo they'll love it. Finally, consistency. Tracks every day, shows every week like clockwork. Bill's Patreon got me through the pandemic. Try it out if you haven't, and think about what you've got, how yours might work. Next. Let's look at gaming. No, no, not gaming. Let's look at the metaverse. Because it's not about gaming. It's about the universe of people hang out. We'll talk about that. The metaverse, the collection of digital spaces in which users can interact with a computer generated environment and other users. Thank you very much. Our conclusion, it's time to play, get involved. Why? First, it's huge. The video game industry is more than 20 times the size of the electronic music industry and growing rapidly. Labels are investing and seeing returns. Most importantly, though, it's where the kids are. Even before 5G, VR and AR and all the promise they bring. Even before that, the digital world is as real to kids as the physical world is to us. As a parent of two kids, I can tell you this is definitely true. They want digital merch, not IRL presents, and they favor in-game events over going out. Think about that. Think about the implications for being present in the lives of the next generation. Get involved. The metaverse is not about gaming. It's where people hang out, be there. And we have only scratched the surface of what's possible. If you look at Travis Scott in Fortnite, epic engagement, epic concert tour, whatever you call it, preceded by electronic artists, followed by electronic artists. An awesome way of doing it, but only one. Look at Circa Loco, Rockstar Games partnership. Another interesting way of being in the lives of this generation. Look at the Sandbox, a decentralized virtual world that Dead Mouse and Richie Horton are deeply involved in. Another way, there are many more. And let's look at a quick example. This is a virtual gig, DJ, fans, and through the lens of webcams, you get to feel like you're really there while you move around the space. This might not be for you. This might not be your taste, but the quote on the right brings it to life perfectly for me. The next generation of musicians and music executives will have grown up with the metaverse. They will not see it as weird or strange, and they will be coming up with all kinds of inventive ideas for how music fits into these spaces. Go join them, go compete with them, or leave it to them, it's up to you. But this will happen. Get involved, time to play. Next, let's look at good causes. And there was so much activity by our industry in this area over the last 18 months. True therapy for those in isolation. First, live streams. Huge number of live streams huge resources and effort devoted, not for the benefit of making up for missed DJ fees, 
but for making the world a better place, whether it's buying PPE or feeding people, millions and millions of dollars raised, live stream records and impact all around the world from local communities to global initiatives. Tremendous investment and time and effort, not just uplifting people, but genuinely making a difference in their life. Let's look at albums that were released. This from my personal uh, collection, Bandcamp albums that I bought that donate money to artists uh, struggling or PPE, buy PPE for nurses or raise money for nonprofits. Tremendous contributions. We spoke to one uh, producer who created this album. The story is amazing. 56 six tracks of awesome electronic music, which he got into the top five of Bandcamp's overall ranking. Quite an achievement. Raised a good sum for charity, but told the story of the pandemic. Music created from inside lockdown rooms, looking through these very windows, which formed the artwork to the album. And he told me a story of how he had to leave his apartment in the middle of night in Italy, deep in the middle of lockdown, to sneak into his studio where he then stayed for days on end to mix and master the compilation. Just another story of the sweat and passion that's gone into helping each other during this pandemic, helping audiences and helping nonprofits and charities around the world. We did so much. Electronic music helped people to feel together when we had to be kept apart. We raised record amounts for good causes in 2020. My question, my challenge, the big opportunity, how do we keep that going when we're back to a world of parties and dance floors? Next, let's look at diversity. Breaking new ground, which we certainly did, but with tremendous challenge and opportunity still to come in this space. First, on the topic of race, electronic music soundtracked and supported racial justice over the last 18 months. Many electronic artists, labels and clubs and festivals came out strongly in support of Black Lives Matter. However, now, 12 months on, we must all ask ourselves if we've done everything we can to go beyond soundtracking and supporting to actually delivering on the promise of racial justice. 12 months later, are we hiring, booking, doing A&R and promoting differently? Ask yourselves that. On race, let's take a look at some numbers. We want to be able to measure progress here. We took the DJ Mag Top 100 and we looked at the Google search volume over time for different lists and in different countries. Here's what we found, a positive and encouraging trend. Progress is being made in general. Take a look at 2017 and the full report to better understand some nuances. The progress is being made, it's slowing down though, it's not accelerating. Although this is pre Black Lives Matter, pre the commitments to change. Let's see next year what happens. It has been slowing down though, and in some countries it's not going as fast as it should be. So good measurement, good progress, but room to improve. Let's look at gender. We did the same analysis, but for the top 100 DJs looking at female DJs in that list, we see more rapid progress, particularly in some countries, but the same message, overall low levels, and therefore a big opportunity and a very big opportunity in some countries to promote support uh, and drive demand for female DJs. Let's take a look at countries where representation of dance music is growing, where we're driving new audiences. Brazil, Mexico showing huge increases and driving the increase globally in electronic music consumption and demand. And then let's take a look at Saudi Arabia. In a country where popular music was outlawed for so long, a number of artists are working to legitimise DJing and dancing. Not without controversy. We spoke to a number of people involved and in Saudi, and here's what we found. This quote sums up the feeling from the DJs that played, the Saudi DJs particularly. DJing has been around underground behind closed doors, but today you can choose to actually be an artist and make a decent living out of it as one Saudi DJ and music producer who performed at the festival told us. And here's a quote from a young woman in Jeddah. 
I felt like I belonged a little bit. I don't think in Saudi Arabia I ever felt like I belonged. Genuinely moving people, genuinely inspiring people to take up the art form that we love so much. But with good economic implications as well, artists that performed at the festival still had 36.5% more demand for them relative to artists that didn't perform even 12 months later. So pioneering dancing and DJing in, in this country, but also driving fan bases and audiences that will sustain. Finally, let's take a look at the valuation. Let's sum all of this up into some hard numbers. Clearly it's down, but very much not out. If you look back at all the previous IMS valuations, you see tremendous growth and then a period of real consistency. Well, until 2019, of course, no surprise to estimate what's going to happen in 2020. But let's walk through that piece by piece. First, if we break 2019 down into its component parts. You see the clubs and festivals, DJ and artist earnings were the biggest sections of the valuation. You know what's going to happen to those in a minute, don't you? Clubs and festivals, we estimate to be down $3.4 billion. 78% of the value of clubs and festivals wiped out in one year. Temporarily, of course, but still. On DJ and artist earnings, we estimate them to be down $743 million. That's 68% loss of value in that one category alone. Again, think about those charity live streams that were raising money, not for artists, but directly, but for audiences, beneficiaries. Now, two pieces of evaluation which were thoroughly decimated during this difficult time. But that's not the full story. Music, sales and streaming are up $48 million, up 4% year on year to a record high, broke a billion dollars for the first time. So two stories of decimation, one of a record high, no, nope, two record highs, software and hardware, DJ software and hardware up $203 million is our estimate, up 23% year on year as hobbyists entered the market or beefed up their systems. So all in all, the pandemic has temporarily set back our industry to $3.4 billion, a size last seen more than a decade ago, but under the surface, really mixed messages. Parts of our community who are thriving and seeing record highs parts of our community have been thoroughly decimated by this, much like the story of the pandemic overall, as some thrived and some suffered. That's our report for this year. From devastation comes innovation. You've seen all that innovation. You've seen that devastation. And again, that's the easy part. How do we keep up that innovation in a world where we're back to dance floors and parties? I want to again remind you to go download the full report, 97 pages, 22 interviews, 35 data sets. It is gold. Go get it. And if you want to help shape our future reports, please get in touch. I'm happy to present this to your team to debate the conclusions as it relates to your business. Now, let's see what the panel has to say about this, shall we? Thank you so much. Hello everyone, I'm Katie Bain. I'm the director of Billboard Dance. And thanks to all of you out there who are watching us and thanks to David for his fascinating and I think uh, optimistic report. Um, I'm here along with our panelists to really dig into it. And so I'd like to start by introducing them. We've got Bart Cools, the executive vice president, president of global A&R and marketing for dance music at Warner Music. We've got Mark Lawrence, the director of electronic music at Centric Music and Beatport's director of industry relations, Susan Gloy Cruz. And so before we get into our discussion, um, if you have answers out there in the audience, we want to answer them. And so if you're watching on Twitch, you can enter those questions via the chat. And if you're watching on Facebook, you can drop your questions into the comment section. 
to get started with you guys. Uh, so David talked quite a bit about how hip hop is looking like it's plateauing and dance music is in potentially a good position to sort of slide back into the top spot in terms of mainstream popularity. Um, I wanna to talk to you all and get your ideas about how, how we would do that. Um, Mark, why don't we start with you? Well, I think what's been interesting through the sort of the enforced um, removal of, of the live scene throughout 2020 is what we've seen is um, a different form of creativity instead of the kind of two week cycle of making music to be released, to be in the shop windows, a business card for gigs. A lot of artists and producers and creators have taken time to work on types of music they wouldn't necessarily they, um, record or write. So more down tempo, more elaborate, more vocal, more song based. And so I think that what that will naturally lean to is greater radio play, more use of electronic music and film, TV and sync. And so it will find new audiences through through its new styles and its new formats, I think. So certainly from our side on the publishing side, we see a very rich and diverse electronic music scene emerging as live re-emerges with, with a greater depth and breadth of talent and style. That's, that's interesting. Susan, is that... Um you know, parallel to what you're seeing over in your position? Yeah, definitely. So everyone is really hungry for live music coming back. And so the demand of electronic music um, we see in our numbers is increasing, which is really, really great. And what you can definitely um, see as well, generally speaking, is that you listen to way more electronic music now on TV ads and uh, all around uh, the interest in electronic music is really, really big. And then once live events come back, I think this will definitely go through the roof. Sure. Bart, what, what are your thoughts on this, this one? Well, I think this, uh, but I, I do think that David in his report actually sort of does the whole hip hop against dance or electronic dance. Like, I, that's not how we or I see it. It's like, I think dance music is, has been strong, uh, obviously, sort of coming off a, a massive high four, five, six years ago, and then sort of now gone back to its normal level, if you like. But at the same time, it's sort of it's so much more accepted and it's so much more widely spread through geographic expansion as well. It's like we, what we see is like sort of the effect of dance music into India or China, or sort of like South America now as well, Brazil. It's like the, the explosion there. Uh, it's it's quite fresh and and refreshing as well. So like I think the amount of talent that can come out of sort of lesser explored regions if you like is uh, is uh, is uh, is very hopeful uh, for all of us and what i also um, believe is that the the, the the sort of international feel of of dance like the, the difference between like the, the massive peak in hip hop like partic particularly in france german Ital italian hip hop they're all obviously mainly local languages uh, hip hop artists um, and for us on the on the label side major label side it's like that is hugely important and there's people you know working on that but if you look at sort of where you get like the huge international tracks then i i really still think that like dance is the first place to go to actually get tracks that sort of have where it doesn't really matter too much where they come from you can have a massive russian global hit with a dance record it's a little bit more difficult to do that with a Russian hip hop record. Sure, that that makes sense. And, you know, in terms of sort of regaining its, you know, position from previous years, do you think that's even an expectation or a desire? Like, is anyone thinking, okay, dance music is going to return to the level, you know, that we, we was at in 2016? Is anyone even trying to do that? I don't know. I don't really look at it like it's in a sort of a, sports terms is like it's not about who's one and two it's like it's just like from where i'm sitting and 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 the the, the labels and 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 uh, music that i oversee it's been steadily growing uh in the last years i mean admittedly at a slower pace than like four or five years ago but and what we see now is like or what we feel now is that there is going to or we think there's going to be a swing back towards that sort of dance music in all these genres is like from pop dance to tech house to techno and and it's like uh, particularly also with live music or live shows coming back i don't really see i don't really see that as a competition 
between genres. It's like it's just like we do what we need to do to actually work with the artists that we want to work with, and we and I kind of we we predict that there's going to be growth. So we're staffing up and we're buying into sort of markets that we don't have yet, uh, and that is not just growth as a, as a, as the genre globally, but also because obviously we're going into new markets and there's new platforms coming on board. I mean sort of anything that's happening on Peloton is sort of more, it's, it's, it's like that's sort of, that's a big, big account for us now, like particularly for the sort of specialist dance labels, that is that is where it's at. To add from a Beatport group perspective, yeah. we obviously, you know, invest in both the electronic music part with Beatport and then with BeatSource, um, we really tailor okay. the, the offer towards um, hip hop. So we think uh, both genres are definitely, you know, high in demand. So we have the dedicated um, services for both. Yeah, and I think as well, it's, it's interesting to look for maybe a 30,000 feet up because where once it was easy to draw a line in the genre sand and say, this is dance music, this isn't. Now, if you stroll down the commercial top 10, you know, there are tracks there that are, you might not be hearing them in underground club, but the format structure and sounds are electronic music. And they're probably falling outside of these numbers and they're in pop music, which is the biggest sign of success you can probably attach to electronic music is it's, it's gone so mainstream, it doesn't even fall in the numbers anymore. So, you know, it, it's, are any of Joel Corey's releases in the numbers, for instance, because that is in a way a, a kind of a, a real pat on the back for electronic music and, and how it's commercialized and gone mainstream. But at the same time, I think kind of what, what's emerging out from underneath that, that mainstream, I guess you know, the, the mainstream always needs an underground to fight against it, to keep refreshing electronic music. And it's once again becoming rebellion music. You're seeing marches in major cities accompanied by electronic music techno has found its voice once more as a music of rebellion so i think i think what you'll we'll see is a resurgent underground come out over the next 12 months that will find slightly new flavors of electronic music than those that came into 2020 and i think you'll start seeing them rise up on beatport fairly quickly and and like we've all said as soon as the you know kind of the the pop of the of the bottle of the live sector returning, you'll see genres like drum and bass just lift because they're such explosive genres to be at a festival to or to an event to. You know, that release will will create some resurgence there as well. I think so. I, I'm, I think like everybody on 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 this session are extremely confident about what's coming. Um, I think it's going to be a really revitalised electronic music scene in general. But I think there's going to be some really surprising subgenres sort of emerge out of it that have been formulating behind closed doors for the last 18 months. Sure. I, you know, an artist said to me a few weeks ago that um, because of artists' necessity to sort of rely on streaming during the last 15, 16 months, artists have been sort of playing a little bit safer in terms of releases and releasing music that they know will stream well. And in the next few months, as things reopen, we are, you know, probably about to see music that's a little bit weirder. Do you think that that tracks? Yeah. Possibly. Let's hope so. <laughs> and, and from each of your perspective, you know, positions, um, obviously this is a really singular moment for the dance music industry as things reopen. What do you, what are you each doing to sort of, you know, be, prepared for what is about to happen and sort of what is starting to happen? I can speak from a centric perspective, which is we went, we went into 2020 with a very clear plan to invest in electronic music, to invest in new talent, to invest in, in new music and creativity. And when, when kind of the lockdowns hit, we, we had no desire to change plan, you know, because it, we saw everything as a short-term problem, really, if you like. We weren't seeing it as any cause to panic. So we maintained our confidence, which is to invest. I think we invested something like 750,000 euros into the underground in, in 2020. Um, we built and attached a, a creative division into electronic music specifically so that we could invest in, in artists emerging and existing into into creative projects into new music so that whilst we, a lot of that we were going to do anyway in some ways we accelerated that because everyone who was not 
gigging was looking for an outlet for their creativity and we were able to make a home for that so in some ways our preparedness was already there by doing what we did in 2020 because that investment into artists and that investment into resource and that kind of the inspiration i guess that we enabled in in our writers and our producers will now kind of flourish in 21 22 fingers crossed got it Anything you want to add there? Yeah, so same here. We always, um, you know, believe and invested in innovation and community. And I mean, the community aspect was, I think, the most important one to get through this um, pandemic together. So, you know, we speak about live streaming, I'm sure, a bit later as well. But that was a huge um, success for us and how to con connect the community to um, yeah, still bring, bring people um, back together. And our strategy um, around our products, which is, you know, um, going into streaming for DJs as well with our link ecosystem, you know, this was the innovation that we could um, release throughout the pandemic and even got people who were interested in electronic music, interested in perhaps doing their first ever mixes, get into the game with some, um, you know, a web-based uh, DJ application, just recently a, um, a mobile app. So. We continue to, um, you know, innovate and build the community. And um, definitely what we're doing right now is looking into which festivals are going to happen, um, which brands can we um, include um, for this together to really be prepared when the, when the big events are back, that we can stream some of those, but obviously be um, on site as well. Great. I think the same sort of from Warner's perspective is like we've been, We've been uh, investing in dance music for years now, sort of uh, so buying into spinning records, uh, setting up a new label in, in China recently, it's called Wet Records. So it's bit, bit, both on the sort of the depth of the catalog that we that we want to have and artists that we want to work with, but also geographically to make sure that we have feet on the ground to actually service those deals and make sure that that we sort of don't drop the ball, um, um, you know, once the music is out. Um, and and the sort of the structure of, of major labels at the moment is like where you, where you can actually through distribution services like ADA offer label services or distribution services label services proper license deals up to artist uh, artist deals so everything on the spectrum basically gets uh, gets invested in gets looked at and gets uh, serviced and, and sort of make sure that we can I sort of have global support structure to make sure that that is what it is it's like it is sort of a global uh, genre at the moment uh, always was actually but it's like it's it's so much more visible uh, than it is um, you know with the first hits coming out of Africa hopefully soon also out of China and India and, 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 uh, and, and Brazil. This, it has already got that moment now. So it, 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 yeah, all that means that sort of the, 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 sort of the, the, the vibe on, on dance music within labels is very, very positive. Got it. You perhaps just answered it, but I know during the report, David mentioned Canada and Germany as areas that in particular contributed to the growth of dance music's global market share. I mean, what, what is happening there that, you know, isn't happening anywhere else? And then what other territories do you guys have your eyes on? Well, I can think I can talk to Germany because it's like what happens there is that dance music or maybe what, what some people would more describe pop, pop dance, Joe Corey, uh, Robin Schultz, David Guetta, uh, is everywhere. It's like if you look at the German airplay charts, it's like I think uh, the last time I looked, or even the European airplay charts, is like a third of the top 50 airplay tracks in Europe are dance records. I mean, not techno records, but pop dance records, like sort of with, with sort of what we would still qualify as electronic or dance music. So it is, it is a big chunk of what's going on in media. Uh, there's a lot of talent there. Uh, there's a lot of talent that's actually been picked up and signed and developed. So it's like there, there is just a lot, a lot of buzz. So that is sort of what makes the market so healthy. That makes sense. Uh, Mark and Susan, in, term, in terms of that or places you're watching, what would you like to add? Yeah, um, so um, just echoing what, what Bart just said, you know, I'm dialing in from, from Germany. And yes, if you tune into the radio, you hear a lot of 
um, dance music, um, that's for sure. And when you come to Berlin, you know, the, the, the hub of our <laughs> club scene, there you have even the underground radio shows that are very, very popular as well. So that's definitely this. But when it comes to, you know, new markets um, that we want to go to, it's, def it's uh, actually a project I'm, I'm working on right now. And, you know, some country names already um, were mentioned. So, um, of course, it's 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 good to see and look into the Indian market, you know, the African market, um, Russian market as well. Um, probably, you know, uh, some areas in Asia. So definitely, we have a we have an eye on what's what's going on there and how we can, you know, better um, be be present in these regions to support um, the growth of the community there as well. Yeah, I think I think it's interesting, isn't it? To, to look at some of those territories you mentioned, like Canada, where are these kind of growing hubs of innovative new electronic music? I was at the, the um, Alberta Electronic Music Conference just at the end of 2019. And yeah, everyone, not everybody, that's a nice exaggeration, but a lot of the people making the music and performing the music and at the conference and being there to attend were under 30. It's a very, very different energy and a very different outlook. And you know, for, for my sins, I've probably been to most of the conferences around the world and there's a certain profile of, of people that attend in, in some of the more um, uh, long in the tooth conferences or longer standing conferences like ADE and, uh, and IMS in Ibiza where, you know, they're, they're important deal making networking events. And then when you go out to some of the new ones, like you go out to IMS in Malta or you go to Alberta in Canada, you, you see something totally different. And you see that like the kind of the next wave and so i think brazil is always interesting as well for that reason and there's some really really exciting talent coming out of brazil and i think it's like bart said the music itself is without language and and very often you don't need a lot of language to make a track very very successful they export brilliantly so a number of things have happened you've got these emerging territories that have grabbed hold of technology without history um and of course everybody you know you, you kind of laughing you look at some businesses that are ready made for lockdown because they're already working from home well if there was a business that was already ready made for lockdown it's electronic music producers sat in front of laptops i think you know kind of put all those together and you you really have got as i think we've all said an exciting couple of years ahead in terms of what's coming and it's coming from everywhere got it that's that's good to know and yeah very exciting I, I you know i think that something that's been on everybody's minds with the lockdown and with live streams is this sort of tension between uh platforms streaming and and labels um it's a huge issue what do you guys think needs to happen in order for you know everyone to sort of get this sorted and have you know legally licensed music um <laughs> More business affairs people working on it, maybe. I don't know. It's like, uh, I mean, it's not my, I, that's not the sort of part of the business that I'm sort of very involved in. So I can't really comment on that. But like, there, if there is a platform there using music, then we do all we can to actually license them or to come to some sort of deal with them so it gets all monetized, if you like, or people, people get the money they deserve. Not always easy, but it's it's work in progress. Yeah, I agree. I think there needs to be a slightly increased level of pragmatism in the industry around deal making, which is understand that the first deal that you get might not be the last deal you get and see it as steps. And I think all too often some of the big negotiating groups kind of go in with their size 15s on right at the beginning of a, of a services um, uh, life and sort of kick the life out of it all too soon. But at the same time, very large companies launching new and emerging services you know, need to get to grips with the fact that they're using people's content and their content needs to be paid for. So, you know, but a lot of us can probably sit here being fairly conflicted about the different streaming services that we've used or used for audience growth or have got our content or our voices or our heads on at any one point in time over the last 18 months. I think the key thing is, you know, support organizations like the association for electronic music they're trying to make some some kind of standards in the industry around streaming services and pull performing right organizations together and say can we all act as one and give services life but at the same time give people money yeah i can i i ho totally agree because in the end we all want the same so even though it's not my area of expertise but i think transparency and just you know coming together and finding a solution that's that's it and what mark said you know the association for electronic music could really be a, a good mediator um for this 
And in, in terms of, you know, the narrative around royalties this year, was, was that it or are there other, you know, obviously there's a big problem with sort of unpaid royalties and, you know, artists not getting the money that they've, they've earned. Um, what was the big narrative with royalties this past year? Well, as far as I know, we pay all the royalties we have to pay. It's like, I don't really, there were, I mean, what do you what are you alluding to it's like because that's a bit unclear to me well i know that um you know mark and i have spoken in the past about you know with with live streams and live sets for example there are you know there's an issue of you know sort of money being paid out that doesn't actually land with the artist that has earned it because it's not tracked properly um mark are you seeing sort of any headway in that area yeah i think it's been a huge amount of work to get accurate music recognition technology on radio, on streams, on all of the services. Um, a whole industry has sprung up in music recognition technology over the last three or four years. And it's just it's just such a shame that's, that, of course, so much of that was focused on live events. And just when everything seemed to be coming together to accurately identify music to, to pay people when their music was played, the, the world came to a standstill. But that means that at the same time, all of those companies have been looking around at other places to put their digital ears to and those digital ears have been listening to streams and helping companies like publishers and performing right organizations identify it so i think there's a huge amount of progress being made but what that was always going to do was shine a light on the level of royalties so when, when you understand that you've been played somewhere then you understand how much you've been paid from somewhere and i guess that's the second wave of the discussion over the next few years is now i know wh where my music is and now i know how much i'm getting paid people will determine whether or not they're happy with that amount. Sure. So, sure. I mean, and we could, we could list that in sort of things that, you know, have the potential to change as clubs open their doors again and festivals open their gates. Um, I mean, do you see sort of the way that these places operate on sort of a functional level changing in any way post pandemic, or is it just a matter of, you know, turning the lights back on and opening the gates and everything's going to be sort of business as normal? I don't think it's going to be business as normal for a while. I mean, we we have the we work with a lot of partners in DJs and agents and and managers, and I think everyone is increasingly confident and hopeful, but also fearful of you know, break, outbreaks of of infection and the fact that they can't get adequate insurance and the fact that you have so so much is invested into an event. Um, from the talent to the toilets, as it were. And if those things are pulled away at the last minute, you, the risk is always, and the burden is always on the promoter. And so that I think is, there's a very um, unhealthy focus on how alone everybody is in the life sector versus the government support or the absence of government support that's not really enabling it. We, you know, we're, even here in, in the Balearics, in Ibiza, in Mallorca, there are test events taking place or just taking place. And whilst it could be deemed a success, you know, there, there's no margin in those events. Those are loss leaders and you know, everybody knows how much cost and how, how therefore how big a throughput of people that you need at events for them to make money and um i don't think that kind of profit and that kind of margin is going to be there for those businesses for a while if the way that they've been constructed carries on susan Bart, anything you want to add there no i agree i mean i don't I mean i'm not so, so deeply involved in in the life part of the business and and, and clubs uh i mean just from my own point of view, that's like I wish they would be back sooner rather than later. And for me, as as they were, is uh, great. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm you know I hear people obviously with the same worries that Mark just uh, mentioned. It's like uh, there's a lot of uh, in uncertainty and a lot of uh, fear as well, and optimism, but you know mixed mixed feelings. And it, and it seems also that there's a lot riding on the fall and events coming back September, October, November, um, you know, later in the season. Um, do you still feel that sort of um, the support around that timeline or do you feel things shifting as we sort of get into the summer? It, I, I, I think it depends on if there are more, you know, um, variants of the, of the virus. Um, coming up you know if if we can 
continue the pace of um, getting people vaccinated that want to be and um, having solid testing before an event and, and all of this, then, then I see that some stuff can come back. But if there are any other you know, variant like uh, the, the Delta one right now, you know, if there should be an additional one, of course, this is always the risk that is out there. And that makes it so difficult for everyone in the life sector to really go out and, and, and plan, yes. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we, we kicked around way back in kind of March, April last year was, was understanding how the music industry was, or the life sector was going to change over the, over the next few years. And uh, our view was that you're going to have global, digital and local physical, which is that, you know, you, there was going to be so much investment in, in kind of um, um, different digital models to consume live streams that you would almost be part of the audience. And that was how you could have a, how you could have certainty around live events was them for not to be physical events. And then the only way you could have certainty around health and to, to avoid visas being blocked or costs of flights or, or dis disruption and damage to, to, to your, your plans would be to only hold small physical events until the world was, was normal again, if, if it will be. So and I, I think that's going to carry on. I think if you look around Europe and you look at Brexit politics around travel and flights and ambers and greens and how the US is opening, you just see, I think, for the next, the next 12 to 24 months, that local physical strategy will be maintained and you, you there aren't that many um djs jumping on planes at the moment to travel around the world taking the risk of a gig in miami or austin or further afield so i think that will continue for a while thank you mark and we do have a question from the audience um from david actually he wants to know in terms of live streams sort of remaining after shows open up, like how important do you think they're going to be? How sort of embedded are they going to be in sort of the standard structure of any given live event once things do open up again? I think in many cases, particularly big festivals, they were, they were already part of the package. Um, I think people are, are so much more used to logging into them or actually looking at them. Um, so I think that, obviously uh, is one of the things that happened in the last 18 months sort of the the sort of people getting used to live streams and actually enjoying them hopefully um so i, th I think there's still there, there will still be part of the package obviously what what wasn't as widespread was the sort of uh virtual live streams that that um that obviously is a, is a fast growing and fast developing part of the market, uh, which is very interesting. I'm still sort of settling down a bit, but uh, I'm sure there's going to be big developments in that in the next 12 months for sure. Yeah, and I think um, David has mentioned this in the report. There's always going to be a group of people that can't attend the actual events, whether, you know, they um, can't travel there, can't afford the cost of travel, have kids at home or, you know, just uh, don't want to go for that long out and, and rather tune in a little bit from home. There will always be the market. And, you know, as Bart said, we started streaming bigger events before the pandemic hit. So um, this will definitely, definitely continue so that, you know, um, you can somehow be part of such a huge event that you normally can't can't travel to, and uh, definitely what's uh, super interesting for the next uh, for the next uh, generation, especially, is when it comes to everything metaverse and interactive and stuff. Because yes, that generation is definitely fully fully has fully adopted um, these kind of events already. So there is uh, there is more to come. <laughs> Would you say that the, the metaverse is particularly exciting just because it sort of gives unlimited growth potential? Um, it, it seems to be like it's really, you know, a, a place to, to, to hang, hang out with, you know, for the, the, definitely the younger generation. So I still need to get used to it. <laughs> and um, it, it, it seems just like normal, you know, you'd be in there, you can, um, you know, exchange a few things, you can spend money, you can, you know, inter interact with each other. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the in real life, um, you know, environment. So it's it's super interesting field. And as I said, you know, I still need to uh, adapt it myself. But what I've seen so far, it's incredible. You know, there are there are things possible that that haven't been possible before. And that's 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 great. 
And in terms of emerging technology, obviously we saw just the explosion of NFTs in the last few months. Um, how important do you all think that NFTs are going to be as we as we move forward? Particularly given that we know that you know it's such a culture within the electronic music industry, like so much of this content is coming from us. I think they've got an important role to play because they've created an opportunity for unique pieces of art to be identified accurately and monetized accurately. But in terms of creating a scale NFT environment that replaces the current rights infrastructure, it's too early to tell. Everything's, you know, if you want to sell music using an NFT, it still has to connect to the current rights infrastructure to monetize where all those current rights are exploited. So we're, we're either at the beginning of, of a massive period of change, which would be exciting, or it's just a new entrant in the marketplace that has a particular role to play for you know, relatively high value one-off transactions. And I just think also, it's too soon. Yeah, I also think it's like relatively high value one-off transactions is one thing. It's like, I think it, it's also underexploited or underinvestigated yet as to like, it could play a role in ticketing or in like sort of, or in even like sort of, lower i mean that sort of 10 million dollars for this or 15 million dollars that that i think is sort of just that that's not gonna last or that's not gonna be the business the business will probably be more like in you know fifty thousand tickets for something including a piece of music or a piece of art or you know it's like sort of a, on, on a slightly lower level of of uh, of price I, I agree. I think you're going to see a conflation of all of the bits that we're talking about, like identification of music being used. You can achieve that through yeah. NFTs and blockchain and within an immersive or virtual reality environment where you're already digital, you've got digital coins to buy digital things. I think I think we're at the beginning of seeing all of this come together. I think that the challenge at the moment is everything's sat in a separate box and, and everything needs to come into the same marketplace so that you have your physical experience and your digital experience. And that digital experience can be monetized and tracked properly if everybody that wants to sort of invest into it and gain from it plays nicely in the sandpit. <laughs> I mean, that's fascinating. Does that, you know, given given what you guys do, is that concept exciting to you, just sort of seeing all these pieces sort of finally coalesce in that way? Definitely. But it's like, but that, I mean, there is so much to do there and so much to investigate and so many opportunities to explore. And at the same time, obviously, the main, the main, uh, my main sort of day, uh, how do you say, what I do mostly during the day is still try and find develop artists and tracks and sign it's like so there is only there are only sort of x amount of hours in the day that you can work so it's like there is there's a lot to do and it's sort of it's almost like a tsunami of new opportunities that you can sort of think whoa what's going on here uh while at the same time still trying to just do your job right absolutely you just want to read everything that sort of comes out on new opportunities new markets new platforms new uh, new ideas it's like that's almost your day gone though if you want to really feel, follow that that's that's true i guess we just have to trust there's someone in the metaverse working on these pieces for us well, yeah but i know that uh you know the, the hundred million dollar acquisition of david Guetta's catalog was obviously a big story a big recent story um what it what no, do it's I, not what official I, though it's like it's not communicated but i'm sorry the hundred million is just something that David puts in his presentation, but it was never announced. I see. Okay. Well, we can say it was a it was a big ticket acquisition. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, what does an acquisition like that? Obviously, we also saw Calvin Harris uh, sell his catalog. What do they say about the sort of um, you know legacy of dance music uh, with these big artists in particular? Well, to me, it just sort of says that someone like artists like Geta and, 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 and Calvin sort of like there is a catalog there now that sort of goes back 20 years or, or even in some cases uh, more is that it's sort of it's 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 grown up to be recognized as proper catalog because in the same way that 10 years ago or 15 years ago you would have never got this this done because there were 
to, there would be too many people saying, ah, oh, we don't know if a dance record actually after two years it's still relevant or after four years it's still relevant. And I think this, these sort of deals and, and particularly also what hypnosis is doing sort of proves that 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 is that is now um, you know that's over. It's like it's it's sort of part of our culture and heritage and its catalog as as any other rock or pop or or or, or I mean and the same questions now are going are being asked on about uh, hip hop still. It's like mm -hmm. is it really catalog? Does it really does it keep being relevant? Is it just not of the moment? Is it not that one summer? Uh, and it turns out, or at least from my experience and from my uh, from our um, um, research, it's like it isn't. You know, it's like uh, a, a, an amazing dance track is is forever. Amen. Exactly. <laughs> in in terms of other success stories, uh, Susan, of course, Beatport saw you know a significant growth this year, thirty three percent. Um, what was driving that? Uh, and did you guys sort of forecast it, or was it sort of more out of the blue? So definitely, what um, what drove is that people were at home and wanted to listen to music and finally had some time to really, you know, go and and dig in all the music that is available out there. Because as Bart said, you know, time is quite often a constraint. And here, finally, people had the chance and say, look, I really want to, you know, listen to this, build my, you know, build my playlists, build my, um, my collection. Um, and that definitely benefited us. So, you know, the overall increase was uh, a lot of new customers trying out our streaming product and, and staying. Um, and in addition, you know, the downloads in increased as well. So it, it was, it was forecasted uh, for, but, you know, we are of course really, really happy in, in which, um, yeah, to which extent this actually happened, but time helped and uh, innovative products as well. So um, being afraid of uh, streaming um, or streaming into the DJ booth, um, we actually see it correlates positively with, with download sales. And in terms of the sort of top genres, the top performing genres that you had, uh, obviously techno has continued to dominate. We had house, we had tech house, um, drum and bass. Was there anything about that, you know, top five or ten that was, you know, different or significant or sort of reflective of this year? I mean, techno continued to be, you know, number one five years. That's that's for sure. But um, because it's so popular um, in 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 sets, and um, it's the amount of releases that are out there. So you know, a huge community. So the 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 single release itself perhaps did not do the massive amount of of sales, but all together, you know, techno stays strong. But um, we can definitely say house music is uh, is number two, and let's see next year when we when we have the same discussion. Um, I'm I'm actually curious to see which uh, genre will be number one, and um, what um, is really really great to see is the the drum and bass community. Um, so really uh, being active on on beatport, and uh, that's definitely a genre that was on the on the rise um, throughout the year. Yes, great, very exciting. So as we wrap it up, I mean, I think that what we all noticed from the report is that there was a lot to be excited about and optimistic about sort of in the wake of a year that uh, perhaps, you know, wouldn't have been anticipated to be that way. And so I would love to know sort of what each of you are sort of most excited about in the dance music space uh, currently and what we have to look forward to. Mark, do you want to start? Um, <clears throat> I think what I'm, I'm most optimistic and looking forward to, apart from the return of, of live, is is just hearing in the in the correct and proper environment some of the most amazing music that's been recorded over the last eighteen months. So not only seeing that, that amazing release from people thrilled to be back, but also the release from artists and producers and DJs unleashing tracks that have only been heard in headphones and with two other people in the studio or in a car or running you know so i just i think that's for me that's the most exciting thing over the next 12 to 18 months is just getting music back into the environment that it was made for um but also seeing what actually happens to so much of the innovation that's taking place in 2020 and early 21 and seeing where the homes to all of the to the new technologies and the new concepts 
um, become. So I think there's a, there's a lot commercially that's going to happen over the next 12 to 18 months that would be really interesting to observe. And I think creatively, it would just be wonderful to hear music in, in its natural home. Indeed. And I'm glad you brought that up because there was a conversation I was having with someone who, you know, was questioning whether the music that came out, let's say, early in the pandemic will still have a shelf life in clubs and at festivals. And you're saying that you think it will. I think there's probably some classics coming, actually. I think there's been so much time and love spent on, on music in the last 18 months that, I'm, you know, I can't wait for not only the music that was released during 2020 to be on the dance floor, but also the music that we all know is yet to come and how that goes down, because I, I think, as we said earlier on, I think there'll be more creative risks and more diversions from the norm over the next, over the releases over the next six to nine months. I just think it's really exciting. Indeed. I think what you say, Mark, is like that for me, the, the most, or the, the, what I most look forward to is that sort of, okay, you can, you can listen to dance music and electronic music in digital ways, but for me, it's always been a, a very physical way of enjoying music. It's like it needs to be heard and experienced and actually felt in 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 a club at four a.m. You know, it's like sort of in the with the right sound system, and that's I think what what the people I work with and like that I've sort of got you know, that I have like daily interactions with. That's what we miss the most, and I think that coming back combined with and I'm very looking forward to to all those genres that mark was mentioning that would that would come out of 18 months of experimenting people in uh, people experimenting in studios i'd love to um, to hear those as well and like to me it's like whatever happens in the in the metaverse and it's like where that is going and sort of be part of that and following that and then the last bit it's like i really really think or hope that at some stage we find a massive talent somewhere where nobody expects it to come from and that is really desperately needed and it's like we're we're all looking and we're all uh, we're all sort of you know have scouts everywhere and stuff like that so but you know it's like in the next hopefully 12 18 months hopefully there's someone sort of fresh new from a from a from a territory that we least expect it from coming with amazing sounding new things Cool. I love that. Thank you. I, I agree to, to everything which was said. And what, what I'm um, really excited about is that, you know, the whole pandemic made everyone rethink a little bit you now how the industry was before. It, of course, um, brought a few topics more to the to the surface and I hope and I'm really excited for that we are now at a stage where, you know, everyone currently is a bit more aware of um, certain issues and I hope it will just continue to be this and that it's not just awareness but actually tackling things that are difficult in our industry and I, I personally think we're at a good stage where we can really make um, big changes and really come out of this as a um, more healthy and um, probably better industry if that's the right word to say but i'm really excited about this and seeing what's happening in all these different um aspects fantastic thank you all for your insights is there anything that anyone would like to add before we wrap it up oh good, all good. Okay. we're good okay well thank you everyone who's watched us today thank you david for the report and we will see you next year until then be well thank you